his pride. Now we're workers together with him. We don't always get acknowledged, noticed, or paid properly for the things that we do down here, but God is going to reward us. God is going to bless us if we are workers together with Him. Amen. What I want to talk about this morning is we've got about 25 minutes that we are workers together with Him. We need each other. Your need. I need. In this day and time, we are carrying the gospel. We're really needed. Yes. <clears throat> Here's a really familiar passage of Scripture in the book of Genesis. And the Lord God said, It is not good that man should be alone. I will make him. I will make him and help me. Yes. For him. Workers together. Husband and wives workers together. A team. I sometimes when we can get into this we can get into this masculinity of I don't need no help. I've read this passage many times and wondered, and it's kind of comical in my thought, but God looked down and he sees Adam. And he says, and the Lord God said, it is not good that man should be alone. He needs some help. Now, I don't know what God saw. I know that God knows the heart. But I don't know. But it was obviously not good for Adam to be there by himself. According to God's word, he evidently needed help. I don't know what was happening. I mean, just a funny thought hit me one time. That's not blasphemy, but I thought, was Adam talking to the trees? He said it's not good that man should be alone. Was he maybe having conversations with the plants, with the rabbits, that it started to look unhealthy? I don't know. But God saw Adam's heart, and he knew that or he, he needed a little help. God said, I can fix this man up. I will create woman for him. And he will have him a helpmeet. And God reached down and he put Adam in a deep sleep. And he took the rib from his side. And he created Eve from that rib. And, but God made him a partner in life. He made him a helpmeet. He didn't make him a footstool. He didn't make, he didn't take from Adam's foot. He didn't take it from Adam's uh, ankle bone. He didn't take it. God could have done anything in this world. He created Adam out of the dust. But he said, I'm going to make somebody right out of his side. Because they're going to walk side by side through life. They're going to be workers together helping each other in my plan. Now, my husband is the head of the wife. I ain't worth nothing without her. Five cents, not even worth it. No. Sometimes I think I don't need, well, I really don't. Sometimes I act like it, but I know it. It don't take long. I know I need. In my Christian walk, God knew what I needed. We were kids. We were 12 and 15. Talking about liking somebody from where to go. I fell in love with them from where to go. And I was lost and I was still just a lad. But I knew. I knew in my heart. This is the one. God created her for me. He could, he could have made her a 1938 model and I would have never known her except maybe as an old lady. But instead he said, I made Chuck 1962. I'm going to make Lisa 
1964 and they're going to be workers together in my plan. I'm telling you, as a lost 15 year old that, that evening sitting behind Lynette's trailer, I looked into her eyes and I felt it from God as I lost because I knew that God gave her to me. Yeah. And like the Satan in my life, like a destroyer, I don't feel God should have said. We're messed up. It's the grace of God. I was a sinner. Saved by grace. Yes. Not honorable. And we're going to get into some of that in a second. But she's my rock. She's my head. <clears throat> Nebuchadnezzar had, God had, do y'all know when God brought the children into captivity? And uh, that was all God's plan. It was a judgment of Jeroboam. And it was set in place. The only thing that could happen was they could have a good king and reach up to God and then lay it. But Nebuchadnezzar didn't get into that position because of his great wisdom or his great might or his great power or because he was something. Uh, but it was actually God gave it to him. That's right. He set him up. But it was going to his head, and he had a dream, and God was still trying to shake him up, and he was having a dream. Very troubling dream, but Daniel came and said, ah, God's given me the interpretation. Yeah. He gave me the interpretation, told him what's going to happen if you didn't do this, and this is the true prophet of God. It happened. That's we right. know the story. And he said, uh, they're going to drive you. Your dwelling's going to be with the beast in the field. You're going to be eating hay. You're going to be eating grass. Grazing. And Daniel said, but it doesn't have to be this way, O king. Now take heed to my counsel. Listen to me. Reach out to God. Cry out to God. Humble yourself before God. It may be a lengthening of thy tranquility. I kind of get off track here, but going back to the help me, this is what brought me here. I was reading it one day. <clears throat> it's in 2009. And Lisa had gone to Walmart. And I was sitting there with an old glass in her door, and I could see her. She's going up the driveway. And I just read that. I, I looked this morning, when Brother Ernie called me out. I looked that word up. And it's in the Bible one time tranquility. It's in the book of Daniel. But anyway, I had just read that passage. And she had just pulled up into the driveway of my peripheral just like this. And I started about to get out, and I read that, and it said that it shall be lengthening of thy tranquility. And I looked at her, just wrapped up in the word of God. And I said, Lord, there's my tranquility. There's my tranquility right there. We'll work us together. I need my wife. She needs me. Workers together. Yeah. We're not in this alone. That's right. Amen. <clears throat> Here's where it gets incredible. Genesis 2, 19, the very next verse. And out of the ground, the Lord God formed every beast of the field and every fowl of the air and brought them unto Adam to see what he would call him. And whatsoever Adam called every living creature, that was the name thereof. Now, how many still got your place over in 2 Corinthians chapter 6? We then as workers together with him. Can you just imagine this? We know the creator of the universe. If you are born again this morning, if you were saved, I don't even have to tell you that. You know that. We know the creator of the universe. One on one. He spoke to me this morning. He spoke to Brother Ernie this morning. Probably many of you, you can say, yes, I felt his voice this morning. 
Um, we know the creator of the universe, and when we think about that, we know that we are the created. We are not the creator. And I'll tell you, the more I learn of God, the, 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 the more in awe I stand in every aspect, in every attribute, and his, it just his creator. This, this universe, it just it boggles your mind on how big it is. I think the scientists, the deeper that they get, they think we're smarter than ever, we're learning more than ever, and I can't help but to wonder that the farther they dig, the deeper they, that they've got to get it all that much more because it's ever expanding, or, or their knowledge of is expanding. They can't find anywhere to the end of it. God spoke into existence. Right. Let there be light. God spoke it into existence. Right. That's better than me. That's, right. That's over my head. That is over me. In fact, sometimes men in places like to stand out and look at the stars in the morning. We've got binoculars and look at Orion's nebula and, and, and all of these things. Some of the stuff's mentioned in the Bible. But you think, I know the one that created that. And then I look up there and sometimes it just... It almost, it almost wraps But did you know in one place in the Bible, I believe it's in Deuteronomy, in all of God's creation, that we don't even know how far it goes. They say there's, there's, there are stars that are 1,000 times the size of the sun. That the sun, <coughs> they've got ways to measure these things. I mean, if I was a scientist, if I wouldn't say before I was, I'd be saved after. Amen. And so it's so vast and so big and so huge and so huge and so huge. And so, and so the earth becomes almost invisible compared to stars. And all that, you look at Deuteronomy, it says we are the Adam. Yes. And Adam. It's as if, and some of you brothers, maybe you can straighten me out on this, but I'll tell you what I'm reading. God created them and left it to Adam to name. In other words, God allowed man, Adam, to play a part, not in creating, folks, don't, don't, don't overread me. That allowed man to actually play a part and to be a worker together with him in creation. I'll make them, Adam, you name them. Workers together with him. Now, I'm not saying that God needs anything. And God needs nothing. We know that God, he does not need one thing. I'll tell you, I've never got into myself and thought, God really needs me. Well, there's been a few times where maybe it did creep in and it didn't stay very long because God loves me so much. I can straighten you out real quick. I don't need you. You need me. But here's the thing. God did not need Adam to, uh, uh, to be a helper to help him create. God didn't even need Adam to name the creatures. God was very well capable of doing that. But I'll tell you the thing that overwhelms me was God desired Adam to be a part of it. And folks, this morning, God desires you and I, every one of us, to be workers together with Him. It's a wonderful calling to be a Christian. We take it lightly. Now, think about this. Jesus told him about the king that's going to have a wedding and he went and he invited these people. I've never had a king invite me to anything. In fact, I don't think anybody above mayor has ever even heard of my name. But they made a lot of it. They said, well, I just bought some oats of some, uh, some ox. Got your box. I've got to go prove them. Well, I just got married. This, that, and the other, they made a lot of. Well, we know that's talking about salvation, but are we doing that today? I think sometimes we're getting numb because it's out of season, my brother. It's out of season. Listen, the gospel is not out of season. Folks are out of season. It's not popular, but this gospel is still real. That's right. <laughs> we take it lightly. We make life. It's not uh, what it used to be. 
I wish it was. I wish the church is what it used to be. Yes. I wish we were, Jeremiah 6, 16, stand ye in the ways and ask for the old paths wherein is the good way. That's where I want to be. That's right. Amen. Anybody know any sales going on? Any clearances going on? Point me there. I believe we're here this morning. I believe we're at one right now. A clearance. A clearance. God has made us in His image. Yes, yes. I like to wreck my life up until I was 24 years old because I was in rebellion. I was a lost sinner. Said, well, God rescued us in time. And my son was here. He was here last night. I'm so proud of him. So thankful. They go to first school in Greenwood. But he was a year old. And I'm not even going to go into the details. That daddy was lost. But God rescued us. You would think that we're not worthy. We're not. He'll make us worthy if we let him. Amen. Isaiah 6. What happened whenever Isaiah was your king? Uzziah or Uzziah? I've always said Uzziah and I've been corrected before. I don't know how to say it. Is that Uzziah? King Uzziah? The year he died, Isaiah said, I saw also the Lord sitting upon his throne. High lifted up. And his train filled the temple. And then it goes on and it talks about the seraphims. They had each one had uh, 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 six wings with 20 covered his feet. 20. Brother Jeremy preached on that last night. But Isaiah, when he saw the Lord, just like Job, when God come down in the whirlwind, his reaction was the exact identical same thing. Job said, when I saw him with my eyes, I heard by the hearing of my ears, but when I saw him with my eyes, as righteous and perfect as Job was, he was not perfect. He said, I abhorred myself. I thought I was really something, and I believe that it was. The Bible says he was perfect and upright, one that feareth God and eschewest evil. But the Bible says that there is no man that sinneth not. And so, but Job, when he saw God, God came down and said, Job, I'm well pleased with you, but right now we're going to have a talk. You gird up your loins like a man and stand here and you explain some things to me. And at the end of some of God's conversation with him, he said, I've heard with my ears, but now I've seen it with my eyes and I've poured my flesh. Isaiah, when he saw God, He said, woe is me. For I am undone. You would think that we were not worthy. God has made a way of salvation. God has made a way for us to be worthy. I feel like I wasn't worthy this morning, my brother. I ain't called me. Not because I'm living in sin. But I just don't feel worthy. Do you know what makes me worthy? Because I've got a relationship. Because he, because I let him make me worthy. It's his desire to make us worthy. It's his desire to make us walk upright. It's his desire to bring us in and to be workers together with him. Yes. Jesus come walking up on the shores of Galilee, the Sea of uh, Gennesaret. There at the call of Peter. And he uh, saw a ship there, a couple of ships, and he got on one. And he prayed. Here's what the Bible says. He asked him. Here's the King of Kings, the Son of God. What an honor. Man, what an honor. Wouldn't it be a thrill? Yes. We get all, I mean, we, we find things here on earth honorable. I mean, it's just in the flesh. They don't even compare. Has anybody ever heard of Marty Stewart? Big red boots, cowboy boots, country singer. I've got a cousin that makes his boots. And he also played fiddle for Hank, uh, Hank Williams Jr. At, when he would be on tour. And 
his regular fiddle player. He's my cousin from Sherman Riddle, Bo Riddle. That's what he goes by in Nashville. But he is he he led the 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 music of it and got into his leather craft and he makes boots for or made them for Fort Wagner and all the big national stars or anybody that's you know wants to dress like that. And um, <clears throat> Marty Stewart Marty Stewart sang in Fort Smith, Arkansas. Some years back. <clears throat> and he was friends with my cousin Bo, and, and he knew that Bo was originally from this area, Mansfield. Though he's lived most of his life up in Missouri. Anyway, Marty called him and said, Hey, I'm saying the Fort Smith, I'm laying at the airport. I don't want to call a taxi cab. Do you think your relatives close by? He said, Well, actually, I do. I've got a cousin, my cousin Patsy. Let me call her. Would you, would you get him to come take me down to the city center? So I couldn't believe it. Um, you know, it's a big country star. I mean, he wasn't George Jones or nobody that big. That's a big name. Hear him on television, big hits and stuff. And so, so uh, Bo called mom and dad and said, Hey, Patsy, and my mother's name is what they all call her. Would you go to the airport, pick up Murray Stewart, and take him to the city center? <laughs> Man, I guess it's about 1990s. Buick Skylark. Toodle. I just couldn't imagine my wildest dreams of a big country star getting in the back seat of that little Buick Skylark. But to me, it was kind of an honorable thing. I don't listen to country music. I'm not uplifting any country star. When I got saved, I am Southern Gospel. I probably got a few thousand dollars worth of Southern Gospel. Even old vinyls, half the Goodman's Henson's. All kinds of stuff and CDs galore. That's what I'm eat up with. But but still, it's kind of to me, it's kind of neat. It's kind of neat. It's kind of claim to fame. Kind of claim to fame. Makes it kind of neat. That does not compare to Jesus Christ walking up to the to, to this fisherman by the name of Peter and says, "May I use your boat for a minute?" Can you thrust me out into the water? There are people that I need to preach to today. And Peter obeyed and he listened. And we know the story. And I was talking to you a while ago. God will honor. God will reward us. When we're workers together with Him, I'm going to have to cut this short. But you can rest assured, you may not be patted on the back down here, Brother Arnie. You may not have people uh, inscribe your name uh, up and, and put it in city lights. But let me tell you something. You know this. I know this. But we need to remind ourselves of this. It doesn't matter what kind of name or how people look at you or what they think about you. What you do, it does not matter except what matters is that God knows and God is not an unjust person. God will reward you. He's going to reward you. Nobody else, man. It don't matter. It, 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 it helps. But I'll tell you what else, one more thing is I know whether it's in this life or in the next life, and it happens in this life, enough to get me by. But he does see. And if I can even say appreciate, because God loves us as his children. Amen. I've got some, we've got five kids. I've got some that's living for God and some that's not. And I'm so like, because the one does not feel like Job, I'm very burdened. Very burdened. Job offers sacrifices and prayers continually for his children. <clears throat> Jesus got down preaching. He said, Catch your nets in. Now they were commercial fishermen, they had to make a living. They didn't pass their days, they weren't. Leisure fishing. They had mouths to feed. And they had bills to pay. They had to survive. And Jesus thanked them very handsomely. In fact, it was so overwhelming that whenever Peter saw it, he knew that this just was not a good catch. He knew that this was God in heaven had wrought a miracle that this thing was above natural occurrence 
And he fell and he said, Lord, depart from me, for I am a sinful man. I'm not even worthy to be in your holy presence. And you know what Jesus did? It's almost like he wrapped his arm around him and said, Peter, follow me from henceforth, thou shalt catch men. I want you, Peter, to be a worker together with me. We got the gospel. We got the gospel. This is the notes I made this morning. Yeah, Pastor. I'm right there. I got to shut it down. David's, David's brothers were standing out there. And there was Saul, I mean, uh, uh, Goliath, the Philistine, the giant. And they were being defied. They were being, actually, they were being deceived. <clears throat> and David went out. Well, his father had seen him out there. <clears throat> David had gone out. At the, at the call of his dad, Jesse. And David went out there and he saw what was going on and it shook him up. It shook him up. It disturbed him. He was troubled. He was going from one to one to another to another saying, wait a minute, what is, is this really happening? What I think is happening. He was not disturbed. He was not troubled at this uh, man from uh, Gath, uh, uh, Goliath, he was not troubled about this man. He was uh, troubled about the armies of Israel, the armies of the living God. He was troubled about what is going on here. And so his brother, his eldest brother, Eli, Eliab, and I'm probably not pronouncing that right, but he went to David. I don't know if it was because he was embarrassed he didn't want his little brother to see them, folks. They were being cowards. They were being afraid. They would not go out to battle. They were scared of a giant. We're talking about the armies of the living God. They were very well aware of God bringing them out of Egypt. All of the miracles that God poured, all of the punishment, the judgment that God poured upon Egypt. And so they were well aware of this, but they were cowards in the Word of God because they knew, had they focused on God, they would have known that one man is not going to defy the armies of the living God. So I don't know if Eliab was embarrassed, if he was ashamed. I'm sure there's probably a lot of it. They start throwing darts at little David. And I'm closing. They start throwing darts at his little brother. What are you coming out here for? What are you doing here? It's the nonsense of your heart. You're cracked. You want to come out here and make fun of your old brother? Where's sheep at? He had the sheep covered. He had the sheep covered when there was a lion and bear because he was trusting in God. He had the sheep covered when there was a lion and a bear because he had a hold of God. He had a hold of the truth. They didn't. I'm going to close, but here's the thing. David looked at him, and he answered in one answer, and then he went to the next. It's not a cause. Thank God we're here this morning. Amen. I'm so grateful to be here. Amen. It's so good to be in the house of God. Yes, I'm proud to be a worker together. I'm glad that I'm in the right place at the right time and in my right mind. That is, I, I, I've got the gospel in my heart. I'm saved. Just for being blessed my heart this morning. We've got something to shout about. These are not a cause. I think sometimes, my mind goes back, and I think sometimes my sins are gone, my sins are gone, and I feel like Sister Dean. Woo! Thank you, Lord. Sometimes it's like this. I can't believe it. I can't believe I'm saved. It's like greater than the lottery. I can't believe it. 
Allegiant to Ireland. Islamic law. In our time, if we get big in the, to take a little beak in the hail, we always get the shackle a little bit more. But we're workers together. What are we doing here this morning? I hope we can get a hold of the fact that we've really, there is a cause to be serious. This world is condemned already, Jesus said. And there is only one key right. to unlock that door. And you know where that key's at? Church is got it. God didn't send angels to preach. He's, Jesus commissioned the church. And there's a lost and dying world out there. Is there not a cause? Yes. Can I say one more little thing? And I'm going to shut down. I hear stomachs growling. <laughs> Just in those pecan pies. <laughs> there's four lepers, man. I'm really shutting it down. But there's four lepers, man. It's a very, very familiar story in the book of uh, First Kings or Second Kings. <clears throat> and the Syrian army had besieged the capital of Israel at that time, which was Samaria, the city of Samaria. You know, Judah was over here, Jerusalem, and Israel was over here. And the Syrian host, the military, the army, had besieged, was around that city. They couldn't come in, they couldn't go out. And they were in there for I don't know how long. I know that they were in famine. They were eating things that you normally wouldn't eat. They were going to extremes that was unthinkable. They were dying. They were starving. But God made a way. And there's these four leprous men that was outside the gates of the city. And they were dying. They were welcome to go in. And they were welcome to stay there. They were lepers. They were not worth anything. Kind of like I was until 1986. Told you well, God wasn't worth a nickel. God made me worth it. <clears throat> and so they said, we got to figure out what to do because we're going to die right here. We can't go in the city. There's nothing to do in there to die. If we said here we're going to die, got an idea. What's that? Let's go down there to the host of the Syrians and just fall on their mercy. Thank God for that idea on their head. They made their way down there. And if you know the story, they became wealthy men that day. They went down there and they couldn't believe their eyes. It was a large host. And the air, there was nobody there. There was no sign of anything there. Except all of their tents, all of their goods, all their victuals, all their food, their silver, their gold, their raiment. And they sat there, they circled from tent to tent to tent to tent. And and then they smell them come and says, We do not well. This is the day of good tidings. Uh, we got to go back into the city and let them know. Boys, open up the gates. God has brought us out of this. We can't keep this to ourselves. We got a city up there that's dying. Is there not a cause? That's how we are. We're here this morning. <laughs> God's got us here this morning. We're in our right minds. There's this world out there. They're not in their right mind. I was glad to see our brother get saved last night. Yeah. Yeah. He came to our Sunday school class some months back. And so I wasn't in my right. This world is not in its right mind, but we've got the key. Sure. We're workers together with him. If you're saved, you're called of God into his program, into his plan. Yes. Being, being a worker together with him is not limited to a preacher. We know that. Right. We gotta remind ourselves that. Do you feel called of God this morning? Do you feel God's hand on you this morning? Thank you, Jesus. Did you know? I may be the only preacher here that's ever felt like this, but there have been times that I didn't feel it. I'm like, well, what's going on here? And you know what I had to do? It's very simple. Fall on my face. Fall on my knees. Because I just start to take things lightly. 
God will even feel your call because I know there's a cause. I know there's a cause. And it's important. It's important. Work is forgive. Right.